Life is Strange 2 is a unique beast. Coming off the heels of the first game, it's clear Donut didn't want to play it safe in almost any regard. They could have simply rested on their laurels and gone back to Max and Chloe, but they didn't. Even if they didn't revisit Max and Chloe, they could have set the game in a high school again, but this too was thrown out. Instead, two contrasts harshly against one in seemingly every way. It's clear that Don't Nod were trying to challenge themselves with Life is Strange 2. They had already done high school drama, a static setting, and an ensemble cast, so with 2, they opted to go in an entirely different direction, like a total 180. By the time the dust was settled, it was clear that 2 ended up being much more polarizing than its predecessor. But is that fair? Well, I think so. Read the title of the video, come on. Life is Strange 2, to me, lacks any semblance of what made the original so enthralling. Ever-present characters that you learn about and start to care for as the game progresses? Gone. You get a new cast every episode now. An interesting power that's as relevant to gameplay as it is to the story and themes? Nope. You're not even the one with the power this time. A compelling character drama that keeps you on the edge of your seat? Sorry. There's only two characters that appear in every episode and they are not very well realized. It's baffling to me the difference in quality and care between both games. Life is Strange 1 ranks very high among my favorite games ever. Life is Strange 2, bored, confused, and borderline insulted me for the majority of its duration. I can't stress enough, though I hope by the end of the video you'll understand, just how unbelievably incompetent Life is Strange 2 is to me in almost every way. It blows my mind that the same people that crafted one of my most cherished gaming experiences ever also made this. Before I get any further, let me just say that if you personally love the second game, more power to you. You probably won't find much enjoyment in this video if that's the case, but maybe you'll enjoy hearing an opposing viewpoint. A lot of people's criticisms of Life is Strange 2's criticisms is that too many people compare it to the original in ways which aren't really relevant. Clearly the two games are meant to be very different, so I'm going to try to only compare between them what I feel is appropriate. That being said, even if I were to appraise Life is Strange 2 purely on its own, you'd still be left with a hugely negative review. Hell, even as I write this, I'm not sure to what degree I want to be detached video game analyst and to what degree I also want to be disappointed fan. I guess I'll just play both good and bad cop. I don't really have a game plan going in, so I'll just go through the story and attack each issue as they sprout up. Forgive me if I appear to go on a tangent at any time, but this is equal parts unbiased critique and pure catharsis for me. Let's get into it. The game starts with our protagonist, Sean, being dropped off from the bus after a day of school. He shoots the breeze with his best friend, Lila, and they discuss a house party they're attending later that evening. They part ways and Sean heads home and it's here where we're introduced to Daniel and Esteban, Sean's brother and father respectively. Esteban isn't worth getting too attached to, but Daniel will act as our deuteragonist. Sean collects some stuff for the party and Skypes Lila. Daniel bursts into Sean's room to show him a zombie costume he made for Halloween, complete with fake blood. Sean, like most teenagers would, tells Daniel to go away. And let's pause right here. What's coming up is the first instance of what will become a major trend throughout the game. That trend being Daniel getting he and his brother into shit. For some reason, after Sean kicks him out of his room, Daniel decides to walk over to the neighbor's house to... Well, I honestly don't know. Was he trying to show their neighbor his costume? That doesn't make sense because he and the neighbor kid clearly aren't friends. Basically, and I'll have to revisit this topic constantly, Daniel just did it because the story needs him to. This leads to what I can only describe as a comedy of errors in both storytelling and in universe. So, Daniel somehow ends up spilling all of his fake blood on the neighbor kid and they cause a commotion. Sean goes out to investigate and ends up fighting the other kid. After a shove by Sean, the neighbor kid falls on a jagged rock, I think, and gets injured. By some massive stroke of bad luck, a police officer pulls up on the scene just as this happens. He's not called or anything, he just rolls up out of nowhere. He sees the kid on the ground and thinks the blood is real. With no hesitation, he whips out his gun and trains it on Sean and Daniel in what is the clumsiest portrayal of police incompetence and maybe racism I've ever seen. Now, I know this is a delicate subject, so I'll make sure to choose my words carefully. Faith in law enforcement is at an all-time low in America, with good reason. People are becoming more and more aware of how flawed the system is. That's good. That being the case, there's also something to be said for believability. Life is Strange 2 stretches suspension of disbelief beyond breaking point more than a few times. Unfortunately, there are many cases of police killing which would break my willing suspension of disbelief if I viewed them in a film, but they're real. Truth is stranger than fiction. This is the first of many instances where Life is Strange 2 asked me to disregard critical thinking to a degree which is simply unacceptable. Let me share an example of something similar to better get my point across. In the initial test screenings for Apollo 13, a review came back to Ron Howard, the film's director, that stated that the film was Hollywood bullshit. The review claimed that there was no way the crew on the ship would survive everything that went wrong in their voyage. Despite the fact that they did survive in the original mission the film was based on, the story was almost too good to be true. So, in essence, yes, there have been more outrageous things that have happened in reality, but this is ultimately a work of fiction. Just because something more absurd happened in real life, time and time again actually, doesn't mean that your story won't warrant additional context and reasoning. 
Is this a rookie cop? Is he a massive racist? Is this scene made this way because police are notoriously bad at de-escalation in reality? The simple truth is that he acts so irrationally because, again, the story needs to happen. I'll bring up some other problems with this scene later in a larger context. Anyway, the cop tells Sean and Daniel to get on the ground. Esteban overhears this and rushes to the scene. The events that follow are unintentionally hilarious. Esteban runs right up to the cop, like it almost looks like he is about to put his arm around him. He had quite a distance to go in order to get to the cop in the first place, too. So, Esteban gets shot and Daniel freaks out and unleashes his telekinetic rage, flipping the cop's car and sending the officer flying across the street, killing him. This whole scene is a mess. At best, Esteban looks stupid for getting so close to the cop and not doing a single thing he's told. At worst, some players might sympathize with the cop. No, lethal force wasn't warranted, but the situation looked worse than it actually was from his perspective. Basically, everyone comes out of this looking bad. Sean wakes up to find his dad dead and his brother out cold. In a split second, Sean decides to grab his brother and run, evading the police. I'm not going to stay on this too much longer, since I can buy that Sean freaked out and decided to run, but in what will become another trend throughout the game, characters routinely take the most illogical path possible. Sean, say something. Say, that's fake blood, officer. Say something besides I can explain, because you don't. In isolation, I don't have a problem with it, but in the greater context of the entire game, it quickly becomes irksome that characters behave so stupidly. Two days later, and Sean and Daniel are on the road. Sean has somehow convinced Daniel that they're on a road trip, and they'll meet up with their dad later. A few things. First, Daniel doesn't remember anything after he uses his power in the first episode. This is only a thing in the first episode. Secondly, how is Daniel buying Sean's story? Yeah, he's a kid, but between not remembering the beginning of the trip, still being dressed up in his zombie outfit, and their dad not being present at all, how the hell is he not constantly grilling Sean on everything? Some would say, well, maybe he just really trusts his brother, and yeah, maybe, but there needs to be a stronger reason for Daniel's belief in Sean's story. He's never portrayed as suspicious. Sean and Daniel trek through the woods and camp out for the night. Nothing really interesting or important happens in this part. The next morning, they happen upon a gas station. Sean buys or steals some supplies. No, it doesn't matter which you choose, and the money system amounts to nothing. And he and Daniel go over a map, planning out their route. It's here where Sean is recognized from police reports and basically kidnapped by the gas station owner. Daniel scampers away, though. I'll talk more on this later, but essentially, with Daniel's help, Sean escapes imprisonment and we come to our first big choice. The core of the game, it's said, is about shaping and molding Daniel. Either you raise him right and he uses his powers for good, or you steer him wrong and he uses his powers with reckless abandon. You shape his morality. Daniel knocks out the store owner and you're left with a choice. Steal some camping supplies, or just run. The only thing this choice really affects is Daniel, since you'll never get a chance to actually use the supplies if you steal them. If you steal the camping supplies, Daniel will get it into his head that stealing is always okay, no matter what. If you don't, he doesn't. Apparently, unlike 99% of people, Daniel isn't a context creature. I feel like even at 9, Daniel's age, I understood that just because you're stealing from a violent bigot that kidnapped you doesn't mean it's always an acceptable thing. If you steal from the store owner, Daniel will steal from an ally later. It's insulting, frankly, because Daniel's written like he's 5, not 9. And even then, those were still 9 years where he was raised by Esteban, so just seeing Sean steal once shouldn't be enough to immediately change his behavior. Anyway, Sean and Daniel are then picked up by Brody, a traveling journalist. He conveniently stops by an overlook of Arcadia Bay from the first game and tells Sean he has to move on. And the balls on this game to think it has any business playing Max and Chloe's theme. Time to hit the road. It's pretty obvious what the game is really trying to say here, that we need to move on from the first game and embrace these new characters. Fair enough, I was never really hung up on that before the game came out. Brody rents a hotel room for the boys and goes on his way. Daniel eventually finds out that their dad is dead from a news report and Sean consoles him. They take a bus to who knows where, and that's episode one. What originally struck me about the first episode was just how boring and of little consequence it was. Sure, Esteban getting killed, Daniel's power, and Sean deciding to flee to Mexico was all established, but after that, it's just pure nothing. There are some cute moments between the brothers, but ultimately, nothing in the latter three-fourths of this episode has any bearing on anything moving forward. This is a huge problem with the game's structure in isolation and in comparison to the first game. By the time the credits rolled on episode one of the original, you'd made a few huge choices that affect the game later on, been introduced to all the major characters, discovered and played with Max's power, reunited with Chloe, and vowed to find Rachel Amber. You also very organically learned about side characters through necessary, but not forced, interactions. In two, you learn a little about Sean's family and home life, and then bumble around aimlessly in the woods. Then you get kidnapped, then you meet Brody, then you quickly say goodbye to Brody, then Daniel throws a fit over his dad and the episode ends. 
Bear in mind that episode one of the original took around two hours at most if you went out of your way to see everything. Episode one of the second game takes around three hours, and that was with me blitzing through it. Let's get back on track, though. Episode two starts after a time jump. It's early December, and Sean and Daniel are living out of an abandoned cottage in the woods. Their goal is to get to Mexico, though you could be forgiven for not remembering that since there is no urgency to the plot. Daniel is sick, and Sean gets the idea to travel to their estranged grandparents' house for aid. Oh, and they have a puppy, too. Daniel took it from the gas station at the end of the last episode. Before they head to their grandparents, their puppy is attacked and killed by a mountain lion. A lot of people I've seen have criticized this as a cheap moment, meant to just make the player feel sad for no reason. I'll defend it on the basis that it's an important moment in deciding Daniel's morality. You can either let him kill the cat, or just tell him to leave it alone. Either way, they eventually head off to their grandparents. They make it, and their grandparents allow them to stay. Daniel very suddenly gets over his illness, and then you are subjected to the worst episode in all of Life is Strange. This is not hyperbole. The majority of episode two is spent bumbling around your grandparents' house, doing chores and being annoyed by Daniel. The entirety of the pacing of this game is bewildering. Each episode is longer than any other episode in any other Life is Strange, but with about half the content and interactivity. There are long stretches of boring, poorly written, and poorly performed dialogue constantly, with very minimal player input. The game has no sense of escalation either. It's zero to 100 and back down again, and those are its only two speeds. Anyway, after a while and another time jump, we're introduced to Chris. Chris is Sean's grandparent's neighbor's kid and the protagonist for the Life is Strange 2 add-on episode Captain Spirit, which came out a few months before the first proper episode was released. I won't discuss Captain Spirit in depth here, but just know that it's far more relatable and compelling than anything in Life is Strange 2. Chris and Daniel quickly form a bond over their shared love of superheroes. After some more bumbling the next day, Sean heads over to Chris's house to pick up Daniel and finds Daniel showing Chris his powers. Daniel insists it's okay though because Chris is under the impression that they're his own powers. Chris and Daniel plead with Chris's dad to go Christmas tree shopping, apparently at having escaped Daniel that he and his brother are wanted fucking fugitives. If you're sensible, you'll say, no Daniel, let's not do that, but it doesn't matter. Why the game even gives you the illusion of a choice here, I have no idea. It's another thing the game does constantly, giving you a supposed choice and then just railroading you down the written path, regardless of what you choose. It's ridiculous. Sean has no reason to go to the Christmas market, but does anyway. Why? Because the game needs him to, so fuck his established characterization of being careful and get out there. At the market, we're introduced to Cassidy and Finn, and they are completely insufferable. For now. We, again, just bumble around for the most part until Chris's dad is ready to go. Daniel and Sean go back to their grandparents' place, and it's time to talk about their mother. No, she's not dead, but there's the illusion of a mystery surrounding her. It won't pay off. Her parents keep her old room barred up, and Daniel, since he never really knew her, insists on looking around in there. I say no, but the game says fuck your choice, and I'm made to investigate anyway. Thanks, Don't Nod. So you look through the belongings of this character who hasn't been built up and who you don't know, and you find a recently sent letter from their mom, Karen, to their grandparents. And in it, she says that she would like to be a part of Sean and Daniel's lives again. Their grandparents come home and are appalled at what Daniel and Sean are doing. For some reason. Spoiler alert, Sean and Daniel's mom is just a deadbeat who ran out on her kids, but for some reason her parents act like she's a terrorist. Why their grandparents are so against them wanting to learn anything about their mother, I have no clue. Actually, that's not true. Their grandmother says it's because Karen ran out on her. If only there were some other people who could relate to what she's gone through. Anyways, their grandfather gets crushed by a bookcase and the police show up at their door. The game is on some bullshit. So, if you haven't done anything extracurricular, the officer says that someone saw Sean and Daniel at the Christmas market. Fair enough. But in this playthrough, I called Lila. The officer cites the call being traced as how they know Sean and Daniel are here. So, basically, any which way, you're boned. The brothers are forced on the run again. I'm pretty sure episode 2 is the worst of the game, but then again, they all kind of feel like that. I will give it some points for having Chris's story be pretty dynamic. Depending on how you tell Daniel to use his powers, Chris's story can end in a lot of different ways. Though, like many other things, it'll have no real impact on the story moving forward. Episode 2 is the least eventful chapter by a mile, or at least it feels like it. Your dog dies and you go to your grandparents' house. Almost nothing happens for about two hours and then you're forced to flee. Unbelievable. Just because I haven't mentioned it so far, let's talk about the visuals and sound. On this front, Life is Strange 2 actually succeeds. The visuals still have that same painterly quality that the first game did, just with the fidelity increased. As dull as most of it is, walking through the woods is at least really pretty. The animations are notably improved as well, for the most part anyway. There can be times where characters are too animated, and Sean's animations in particular are pretty goofy. On the whole though, it looks better than the first game. The soundtrack is done, once again, by Jonathan Morali, and it's pretty solid. I don't think it's anywhere near as memorable or as iconic as the first game, but overall it's decent. The licensed soundtrack is pretty good too, though again, I prefer the first games. 
Moving on to episode 3 after yet another time jump, Sean and Daniel are living in the California Redwood Forest with Finn and Cassidy and a group of gutter punks while working on an illegal weed farm. This story is fucking bonkers. I give it some leeway because this is a road trip story, but from this point onward it does feel like the story jumps the shark at the beginning of every episode. I lied earlier. Episode 3 actually starts with a flashback from a few months before the first episode for some reason. In the flashback, Sean is just vibing, and Daniel sneaks into his room to steal something. Sean catches him and a brotherly scrap ensues. Esteban breaks it up and tells Sean he has to be a better big brother. Sean then talks to Daniel and they make up. Turns out Daniel stole a watch from Sean that he really likes, because Sean forgot to get him one. Sean says Daniel can keep it, and that's the end of the flashback. We catch up with Sean in the gutter punk base, and no, that's not an insult. Anyway, Sean goes to check on Daniel who's playing with Finn. Sean and Daniel are becoming more distant for reasons that I'll cover later that don't make any sense. They have a conversation about Daniel's power for the umpteenth time that accomplishes nothing, and Sean notices the watch he gave to Daniel in the flashback is missing. Daniel says he just didn't want to wear it anymore, and instead is wearing a bracelet Finn gave to him. Great drama. That flashback totally wasn't just padding. I'm about to draw what might seem like a tenuous parallel between this and the first game, but bear with me. So in episode 3 of the original game, you can look through Chloe's phone and, depending on certain choices you've made, she'll either have changed her lock screen to a picture of Max or kept the old one of Rachel. It's all determined by how she feels about you as a result of what you've done throughout the game. 2 had a chance to do something similar here, but for some reason it didn't. After this conversation, Sean and Daniel are off to work. I'm not sure how to go about this next part, so I'll just show you. This lasts for about eight minutes. It's also at the pot farm you're introduced to Merrill and Big Joe. Merrill is Sean's boss and Big Joe is Merrill's muscle. Merrill briefly warns Sean that he better keep an eye on Daniel. After work, they head back to the camp and Sean helps Daniel practice his power more. They have another conversation in which nothing is accomplished and Daniel even threatens Sean. Bear in mind, Daniel does this regardless of how you treated him throughout the game. We will come back to that. Sean, Daniel, and the other campers then start a bonfire and shoot the breeze. This is actually a great segment. Each character says a little about themselves and fills the player in on their backstory and motives. Of course, when I say it like that it sounds robotic, but it's actually a really low-key and natural moment. It's the first time the game actually got me to feel something too, when Hannah tells the story of how she had to abandon her dog in order to escape to police. It's a little dramatized, sure, but it's one of the only truly sympathetic situations the game has put forth so far. The next day, after work, Sean and the other workers are waiting to receive their payment for the week. While they go in to get their money, Sean tells Daniel to stay outside and wait. I don't know why he does this, because it's the same room in which they trim bud during work hours, but whatever. As the adults are getting their pay, Daniel sneaks into Merrill's living room and, oh, I see why Sean didn't let Daniel in now. He needed to get bored outside and wander into the living room to get caught by Big Joe so he and Sean would get fired and so Finn could get a peek at Merrill's safe. Gotcha. Sure, it makes sense for a kid to get bored and wandered, but like so many other scenes, this is really contrived. Daniel gets harassed by Big Joe and his only defense is throwing an ashtray at him. Great work. Maybe he doesn't want to hurt anybody, some might say, regardless of the fact he does that very thing at the end of this episode, but I digress. Back at the camp, Sean has to explain Daniel's power to everyone. Finn suggests robbing Merrill's safe with Daniel's ability. Cassidy tells him he's stupid for thinking about doing that. Jacob... Oh, say hi to Jacob, everybody. Jacob is just amazed. Okay, so in this playthrough, I shot down Finn's idea, and I've been pretty positive to Daniel, only encouraging him to use his powers if absolutely necessary. Keep this in mind for later. Finn tries again to get Sean to go along with his heist, and I, once again, shoot him down. Sean parties a little bit, chats with Cassidy and gets a tattoo, they go skinny dipping, yeah, and then Hannah says that Finn and Daniel are missing. They went to rob Merrill. It's clear at this point that you can't really shape and mold Daniel the way the game wants you to think you can. He will go along with Finn on this heist no matter what. Great. Cool. Sean and Cassidy steal one of Big Joe's trucks and head Finn and Daniel off just as they're about to break into Merrill's living room. Daniel decides to fully commit and break in anyway, and they're immediately caught by Merrill, who confronts him with a shotgun. After a boring monologue, Daniel uses his power to throw the shotgun out of Merrill's hands and has no follow-up. Thanks, Daniel. Sean tackles Merrill, gets his ass kicked for his troubles. Merrill switches to a sidearm and shoots Daniel in the shoulder, and then Daniel freaks out, causing essentially an indoor tornado, wrecking havoc on everybody and everything in the building. This leaves everybody, even his friends and brother, injured and unconscious. Sean even loses an eye. I think it's time we talk about Daniel. Daniel is perhaps the worst deuteragonist I've ever been exposed to in any form of media. There are just no redeeming qualities here. A lot of discussion I've seen surrounding Daniel goes something like this. Daniel's annoying, but he's written realistically. He acts how any nine-year-old would in this situation. That's a dubious claim, and regardless, he's not likable. 
Well, he's not supposed to be likable. I bet you like Chloe. She was really annoying. On the claim that he's written realistically, I don't really agree. Daniel behaves and feels however the game needs him to at any given point. There are tons of times where his mood will pull a complete 180 for no reason. I've not mentioned all of them, but basically any time Sean and Daniel discuss Daniel's powers, Daniel freaks and lashes out at Sean, or at the very least is ultra pouty. This scene at their grandparents' house, where Daniel lifts the plates like this for no reason. This scene at the beginning of episode 3, where Daniel attacks Sean. This scene later on, where Daniel threatens Sean with a huge tree trunk. These are the worst examples, but there are plenty more. Whenever they talk about this, it feels like nothing gets done, because Daniel gets angry and promptly shuts down the conversation, and then, inevitably, does the same thing over and over and over again. Why am I even here, game? Sure, how you raise Daniel starts to affect some things near the very end of the game, but until about the end of episode 4, there's very little indication on how you're doing. Daniel will always do this with the plates, always attack Sean here, always threaten him here, and more that I'll cover in episode 4. This is even mostly discounting the times when Daniel gets upset at Sean for something Daniel himself did. Daniel gets upset at Sean for letting Mushroom out in episode 2, despite Daniel having done that himself in my playthrough. He gets angry that Sean is spending more time with the group than with him in episode 3, even though it's shown that Daniel is spending more time with Finn than anyone else. He gets pissy because Sean catches him stealing his watch. He gets upset with Sean and Cassidy because they try to stop him and Finn from robbing Meryl. Like, what the fuck? He has his moments, notably when he and Sean share a brotherly chat that doesn't end in bloodshed, but these moments are optional and rare. I feel like even at 9, I had more sense than this. You also couldn't so easily sway my mood. Daniel goes from happy, to sad, to furious, to fine in a matter of seconds. A lot of people will say, well, he's just a kid. So what? He has trauma, I get that, but again, this isn't real. He can have trauma and still not be a little shit stain. Also, I've never gotten the point that he's not supposed to be likable. I've seen this defended multiple times. If he's not supposed to be likable, what's the point? Why would I want him around? Why would I want to protect him? My line of thinking goes like this. Is he written realistically? No. Is he likable despite that? No. Is he helpful? Not really. Is he written well in any regard? Nah. Sean gives everything for Daniel and never gets anything in return. It almost feels like during the latter half of the game he's supposed to be the antagonist. He certainly acts like one. And just because I've seen this argument made far too often, no. Chloe is not anything like Daniel, and it's disingenuous to imply as much. Chloe could be an asshole, sure, even a touch irrational, but she never actively harmed Max like Daniel does to Sean. Beyond this, Chloe didn't have an annoying and vague morality system. Chloe wasn't the catalyst for every setback and architect of every obstacle Max faces, like, again, Daniel is for Sean. Chloe actually listened to Max. Chloe was helpful and grew throughout the game. She showed remorse and regret. Daniel does no such thing. Chloe had a sense of humor and was fun to interact with. Daniel feels unpredictable and schizophrenic. Upon learning that Max had to sacrifice Chloe's dad so Chloe wouldn't end up paralyzed in the alternate timeline, Chloe cries and apologizes for what Max went through. This feels like a natural progression of her character because she definitely wouldn't have reacted that way earlier in the game. Daniel is, suddenly, much more mellow in episode 5. Why? Beats me. There's no through line or anything to point to to explain why all of a sudden he isn't an entitled brat. Daniel, at best, can be cute. At worst, frequently, he is the source of all of Sean's problems, a nuisance, a villain, and actively harmful to Sean. Wanting to go to the Christmas market, wanting to explore their mom's room, sneaking into Merrill's, going with Finn to rob Merrill, attacking Sean, Cassidy, and Finn, and seriously injuring them, etc. Daniel can lift a huge-ass tree trunk no problem, but when being attacked, he'll toss a pillow at his assailant. He doesn't even bother to see if Sean's okay after his blow-up in Merrill's. His characterization is so butchered and inconsistent at every turn. Max's power in the first game led to severe consequences. Daniel's does too, but only because he's so dumb and he never listens to Sean. Hell, at several points, Daniel even blames Sean for everything going wrong. Telekinesis is so much easier to control than Rewind was, and used properly, there would never be a problem. You could probably remove the telekinesis and, with minimal rewrites, the game wouldn't end up too terribly different. In one, however, there's no way you could remove the Rewind power and have any rewrite even resemble that game. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that Daniel was a constant pain in the ass. He's horribly inconsistent, written with no regard to anything besides what the story needs him to do, annoying and hugely antagonistic. Okay, rant over. Let's move on to episode 4. Episode 4 starts after yet another time jump. Every episode starting after a time jump makes it unnecessarily difficult to catch up with Sean and Daniel's perspective, but I digress. Sean is in the hospital after having his eye removed and gets grilled by Agent Flores here about the incident in Seattle. For some reason, Sean is wanted for the murder of the cop. 
Sean obviously refutes this. He says he didn't do anything. Flores then asks, You sure you didn't get upset and go after the officer? And oh yeah, are you sure you didn't just get angry, flip his car, toss him across the street, and blow up your own house? God, this game is so stupid. I cannot be persuaded to believe that Sean is actually wanted for the murder. Fleeing the scene? Sure. But what evidence do they have to tie him to the murder itself? He never touched the officer, so that rules out fingerprints. Since the explosion was caused by Daniel, there'd be no traces of gunpowder or anything else. Hell, they even have dash cam footage of the explosion. What the fuck is this story anymore? He's wanted just because there needs to be stakes, regardless of whether or not they make any sense. This whole scenario is so contrived and stupid, it's baffling to me that it went past any sort of rough draft. Anyway, Sean escapes the hospital that night to go and get Daniel back. If it were me, personally, I'd leave Daniel the hell alone. Sean steals a car and sets off on his journey. After driving for a day, Sean pulls off in the desert and decides to sleep. I am not looking forward to talking about this next scene. So, as Sean is sleeping, he's woken up by two hillbillies who claim he's trespassing on their property. Sean apologizes and gets ready to leave right before he's pulled out of the car anyway. Good job locking the doors there, Sean. Anyway, the two guys harass Sean and take some of his stuff. Depending on what you choose, Sean might get straight beaten up. The one guy asks Sean if he knows any Spanish, and then tells him to sing something in Spanish. Okay, so clearly we're dealing with some intellectuals here. No, but obviously they're both violent bigots. I chose not to sing anything, and Sean got his shit rocked. So, the issues with this scene are twofold. The first problem is that a lot of choices in this episode and throughout the game, but mostly this episode, boil down to get your ass kicked or get your ass kicked worse. It's such a lazy way to show the adversity Sean's facing. A character constantly getting whooped doesn't make them interesting or compelling. The second issue is that the game seems like it wants to make a commentary on racism in the US, but it kind of doesn't. Now don't get me wrong, I think that it's absolutely valid to want to tackle that subject in a game, but Life is Strange 2 simply isn't equipped to handle it. The game never meditates on why people might think this way, why it's wrong that they think this way, and it never feels like it seriously wants to educate those who might have regressive views. All the game does is show violent racist morons acting violently racist and says racism is bad. I agree game, any sensible person would, but what else do you have to say? Nothing, it turns out. The gas station kidnapping in episode one, the cop maybe in episode one, Sean's neighbor in Seattle, and this scene all just show racists violently displaying their bigotry, and it's like, I get it game, and I agree, but so what? The game literally stops the story in its tracks to show us that racism and racists are terrible. The scene has no bearing on anything else moving forward. Listen, I'm white, so I can't speak on what it's like to be discriminated against on account of my skin color, but let's agree that the French video game studio, Don't Nod, probably knows even less what race issues are like in North America. Let's also consider that racists don't predominantly display their hatred in violent ways. When the game displays racism by characters being dismissive against or rude to Sean, I think it's actually well done. Listen, if you're a racist, you're a fucking idiot. But also, there's a good chance you're not regularly foaming at the mouth just waiting for the perfect chance to viciously attack a minority. Of course, there are people like that, but Don't Nod's thinking is that every racist is just a violent lunatic waiting to curb stomp the first person of color they come into contact with. It's ridiculous, and it's a subject that should be handled with nuance and maturity. Not to say that you should paint racist as nuanced, but there should be an effort to educate. As it is now, all Life is Strange 2 does is build up straw men and then quickly set fire to. Sean is eventually let go and drives off into the night. By morning, his car runs out of gas, so he decides to leg it through miles of desert. This is a far better way of showing Sean's determination and adversity, because walking through the desert for miles on end to find Daniel is, you know, actually relevant to Daniel. A trucker stops and asks Sean if he wants a ride. The game, I guess, is trying to make you doubt his intentions because you're just brutally attacked by some rednecks, and this guy... <gasps> Looks like a redneck too. Weird framing by the game, basically saying, oh no, he's one of the good ones, but I digress. Regardless of whether or not you take him up on his offer, Sean arrives in Haven Point all the same. Sean visits the church and discovers Daniel being used as the centerpiece of a crazed Christian cult, passing his powers off as miracles. The game's story is so absurd. Sure, you can make that argument for the first game too, but at least that all felt like a natural escalation. Two just jumps from ridiculous vignette to ridiculous vignette with almost no time in between. Well, at least for me. If you were playing each episode as they came out, though, I truly feel sorry for you. It leads to the feeling of nothing happening, but also simultaneously everything happening. All at once, and not at all. Anyway, Sean meets up with Daniel, and Daniel is thrilled to see Sean. After assaulting him and leaving him for dead in the middle of nowhere, Sean tells Daniel that they're leaving and Daniel wants to stay. Daniel is super impressionable, apparently. His nine years being raised by Esteban was thrown out as soon as Esteban died, and his guidance under Sean was tossed away as soon as he got to the cult. He's only been here two months. Sean is escorted off the property, and just to get it out of the way, let's finally talk about Sean as a character. Sean is, without a doubt, one of the worst protagonists I've seen in... 
pretty much anything. He has no character. He is painfully bland, weak, and boring. It's so bizarre that Don't Nod decided to make him like this. In the beginning of the game, it's shown that Sean is, like, kind of into sports, but he's not a jock or anything. He's into skating, but he's not, like, really into skating. He's into fantasy and sci-fi stuff, but he's not, like, a nerd or anything. He goes to parties, but he's not, like, a party animal. He smokes weed, but he's not a stoner or anything. He's not a social outcast, but he's not super popular. He's just painfully generic and middling in every way. My guess is that Don't Nod, by making Sean as generic as possible, hoped to make it so that anyone could see a part of themselves in Sean through his interest and ambiguity. This is an awful way to write your protagonist, and it's misguided. Max receives a lot of criticism for being bland, and I don't really agree with any of it. Sure, she's not boisterous or in your face like Chloe, but Max has established hopes, fears, anxieties, and other things that make her identifiable. She worries about not being accepted as an artist with her photography. She feels remorse over how she treated Chloe in the past. She grows and becomes more confident throughout her game. I can say almost none of these things for Sean. There's really nothing beyond, gotta protect Daniel. Max loved photography. I take photos. Of me, the world, everything. It may sound sad, but I have a blast. Even if you don't, you can easily see that it's her one true passion. That's something specific to identify with, along with her facing very relatable and ultimately human conundrums. Sean has a lot of interests, but not really any true passion. Sure, he likes to draw, but he never talks about it like Max does photography. He never says that he'd love to make a career out of it or anything. It's seemingly just a hobby. The closest Sean comes to being compelling on his own is when he's crushing on Jen in episode 1. All of his little quips are worse than Max's too. Replaying one recently, I forgot just how funny Max could be. Sean's commentaries by comparison are not insightful and just plain boring. This is without even mentioning his voice acting, which... I don't know if it's a direction issue or what, but almost every line of dialogue sounds like he's on the verge of tears. When he doesn't sound like he's about to break down crying, it sounds like the voice actor just barely remembered his lines. Wow. Finn trained you well. Six bull-sized dude. Yeah. Other times, it's just plain unconvincing. I, I hate you! As a result of this, Sean quickly became very tiresome for me. Like I said before, Sean also experiences no growth throughout the story. Yeah, he goes to extreme lengths to protect Daniel, but that's present throughout the entire game. He never gains any sort of confidence or toughness, which you think he would after what he's been through. No, I'm not asking him to be Duke Nukem, but fuck me. Anytime you try to confront somebody, even in the later episodes, Sean can barely muster the courage to even make eye contact. Choosing to confront somebody usually leads to Sean very meekly protesting something and then getting pummeled for his troubles. In episode 4, he gets beat on a lot. Like, an absurd amount of punishment has flung Sean's way. It's supposed to make you feel bad for him, but it's hard not to laugh instead as he gets Superman punched for the 10,000th time while making no attempt to defend himself. Sean is grating, unidentifiable, annoying, static, and really just pathetic. There's just nothing to latch on to for me. Even when I was trying to be nice to Daniel, Sean would quickly get frustrated and be a dick for no reason. Sure, he's just a kid, but he doesn't seem like he matures or toughens up in the slightest. Just a truly awful and pathetic protagonist. So Sean gets beat up, again, at the church gate, and Karen, of all people, comes strolling out of nowhere to pick him up. She brings him to a motel and they discuss their grievances. Karen is probably my favorite character in the game, simply due to how unapologetically awful she is, despite the game seemingly trying to paint her in a sympathetic light. She says she left Sean and Daniel basically because, like, fuck society, man, am I right? And she shows no remorse. So you just dumped us so you could be free? Yes, that's exactly what I did. As funny as I find Karen to be, I must also admit that this subplot is piss poor drama. She left because, wait for it, she didn't want to stay. Incredible drama there, game. Fucking imagine if the first game ended with Chloe and Max finding out that Rachel just committed suicide. Like, that's realistic, but what an awful payoff. Anyway, Karen says she'll help Sean get Daniel back. How did Daniel end up here in the first place, though? Well, remember Jacob from the hippie camp? He used to live here and was part of the commune until he decided to run away because the church was too overbearing. He knows just how dangerous the church leader, Elizabeth, can be. After Daniel's little temper tantrum in California, Jacob decided to take him to Haven Point to join the church again. Fucking why? Jacob himself states that he knows just what Elizabeth would do with Daniel, manipulate him, but decided to come back anyway. We find out that Jacob's little sister is also part of the church, and he needs to rescue her too, and I'm like, bro. But we gotta break into Elizabeth's house to steal his sister's medical records so we can help her anyway. We do just that, and it's here where we find out that Jacob is gay, and was made to undergo conversion therapy by Elizabeth. That's why he left the church before. Okay, again, I'm not against tackling this subject in a game, but it's just so... random. Immediately after we learn this, Jacob runs out of the house and out of the game, and it's just like, what? 
Anyway, we now have to go confront Elizabeth in the church and get Daniel back. So, god this scene is so bad. Sean has to basically convince Daniel that it'd be better if they left Haven Point. Elizabeth insists that Sean is leading Daniel astray. For some dumb reason, the church also catches on fire in this scene. While Sean is making his plea to Daniel, he, and I counted, is punched four times and pistol whipped three times by this guy, right in front of Daniel and their mother. This scene goes on for minutes, and it's only when Sean is about to be executed that Daniel realizes Elizabeth is in the wrong. Dude, what the fuck? So Daniel, with the telekinesis, stands by and watches Sean get brutalized for minutes on end and does absolutely nothing. He's a kid, whatever, but come on, how the fuck am I supposed to like Daniel or want him around after this? Sean gets nothing out of their relationship. The player has no positive reinforcement, but we're supposed to worship the ground Daniel walks on regardless. What the fuck was Don't Nod thinking? Sean, block. Daniel, force choke the guy. Karen, do anything. These characters are so unbelievably stupid and forced, in addition to being unlikable and one dimensional. <sighs> Daniel eventually wisens up and throws this guy aside and apologizes to Sean. Too little too late, man. Elizabeth then tries to block them and Daniel throws her aside too. End of episode 4. I think episode 2 is the most boring, but episode 4 by far has the worst writing. The pointless racists in the desert. Jacob's whole arc. Sean becoming a punching bag for the universe. Daniel's stupidity. Karen ex machina. The entire concept of the episode being batshit insane out of nowhere. Episode 5 thankfully improves the game, if only marginally. So Sean and Daniel have been staying with Karen's hippie community in the desert for about a month and a half. Month and a half? I thought we were trying to get to Mexico. Say what you will about the first game's finale, at least that was a climax. Hell, this game wrapped up what could have been a climax at the end of last episode, and now we're just hanging out. So Sean and Daniel hang out at the camp and vibe, basically. We meet a few characters that don't matter at all, since clearly none of the characters matter besides Sean and Daniel. Karen lays it all out and says that Sean and Daniel should probably, you know, actually try to get to Mexico sooner than later. Honestly, the entire goal of getting to Mexico feels totally irrelevant for about 95% of the game. Like, the characters they introduce constantly don't matter, since we'll never see them again. The entire motive for the brothers to be on the run is super easy to forget. At the start of each episode, the previous episode feels a million miles behind us. Nothing carries over, and nothing matters. Well, at least we see David from the first game again. He ends up here no matter which ending you choose in one, which is a little silly, but whatever. You can see a picture of Chloe and Max in his trailer, and it's honestly the highlight of the entire game for me. Sean and Daniel head off for the border and reach the wall. Daniel, instead of lifting the truck over, rips a huge hole in the wall. As they're walking back to the truck, Daniel gets shot by some xenophobics parading his vigilantes. Sean yells at them and, yet again, is knocked on his ass. I burst out laughing the first time I played this part. Like, it's so ridiculous. Why the fuck does Sean never attempt to protect himself? Because the game wants to show the hell he'll go through in order to protect Daniel? It's dumb if the only way you can do that is by having Sean never defend himself. It's even shown in the first episode that he's not afraid to fight, so what gives? Anyway, some real cops show up on the scene and arrest the vigilantes and Sean, once they recognize him. Sean is locked up with some illegal immigrants who are caught trying to enter the US with the vigilantes in the neighboring cell. What follows is the closest the game gets to political nuance. The vigilantes and the immigrant family argue. The immigrants want to become US citizens so they can provide a better way of life for their unborn child. The vigilantes are hateful and obvious fucking maniacs, but they at least say why they hate immigrants. They don't want their jobs to be taken. Anyway, so Sean is taken in for interrogation and somehow is still wanted for the murder. I've already gone over why that's the stupidest thing ever, so I won't get into it now. Daniel eventually breaks Sean out and they head back to the border. Straight to the border crossing, in fact, and I shouldn't have to tell you why that's dumb. Like, go to another random part of the wall again. What are you doing? This is the finale. It's complicated, but I'll try to break it down. If you've encouraged Daniel to only use his powers when necessary, he'll follow whatever you do. So, if you decide to break through, he'll help you, but then jump out before you cross the border. If you've gotten reckless, Daniel, he'll try to break through no matter what. I will give the game credit for having the endings actually be dynamic. Daniel really does change depending on what you teach him. The problem is, you never see that until this episode. I decided to surrender, because fuck you, Sean, and he got 15 years in prison, which is ridiculous. There are seven endings in total, which is cool, but I'm not going to discuss them all here. As dynamic as the ending is, I will also admit that it doesn't really feel like the result of my choices throughout the game. Daniel will use his powers differently, but as a package, it doesn't feel super cohesive. So that's Life is Strange 2. 
Yeah, it's no surprise to me that this kind of flopped. Take everything that was good about the first game, the rewind power, a compelling main cast, a single cast of characters that were well written and grew throughout the story, a sympathetic and believable protagonist, a helpful and supportive sidekick, and everything else, and just throw that shit away. I do not dislike Life is Strange 2 because Max and Chloe weren't the leads. That was never a problem for me. The issue was that when the game wasn't boring, it was nonsensical. When it wasn't nonsensical, it was frustrating. When it wasn't frustrating, it was preachy. When it wasn't preachy, it actively disregarded my choices. Sometimes I'd get lucky and the game would do all these things at once. Life is Strange 2, to me, is a catastrophic failure on every level, and I'm surprised it didn't kill the franchise. The story is horribly written and paced, the protagonists are stupid and unlikable, the gameplay loop is monotonous at best, the episodes are overly long, the choices barely ever matter, the side characters are thrown away almost as quickly as they're introduced, the political commentary is shallow, performances are down across the board, and the charm just isn't there. Sean suffers constantly, and that actually agony, with no joy to contrast against, leaves the game feeling hollow. So, where does this leave Life is Strange? Thankfully, the series isn't in Don't Nod's hands anymore, having been passed over to Deck Nine, makers of Life is Strange Before the Storm, and just last year, they released Life is Strange True Colors, basically Life is Strange 3. Unfortunately, I'm pretty lukewarm to True Colors. It follows in the first game's footsteps more than two, but ultimately I think it's pretty empty. So. What now? Doing something radically different didn't pay off, and if you stick too close to the formula, the series will never grow. I have my own ideas, but that's a topic for another time. I can say with confidence, however, that there's almost no way it could get worse than two. Like, literally, I could not envision that. Whatever Deck 9 decides to do next with the franchise, I'll be there to offer an unwanted, but ultimately unbiased opinion. Oh, fuck.